the archivist. The past clicks us into focus. There's a slid hinge to the edit. In this photo, your father frames you like a fish he wants to remember, slipped and tin, temporarily pliable, propped on his knee. Let's take your brother here, blue face and stuffed, full of berries at the bottom of the backyard, off the bramble of his foot, rolling from the cabinet's carpet like a gum to its tongue, small and sand favored. His cheek still a linen chest of flesh before he turned himself down for girls who developed with their legs poised stern as oars. They were his wife. Their skirts unassailable septums bone walled, and their factory lit health a tithe I find myself paying and saying, well, what's honest is what lines it, is the advertorial milk blanket of your insides. While my friends ask, is this how shit always is? and listen and wonder what fresh therapist will turn the construction belt of their council, tap court shoes square and cock to knock out the Morse code of medication and send us nearing ourselves for three months or about. So I smoke the scalpel of memory instead and scour love in its clot as time consults like a ruler and each inch knows this is the telling, this is the business of my life to talk that bread out of its dripping with the small, sourced animal of my knife. Hello. Uh, it doesn't really sound like the wind likes poetry very much. Um, when I was a teenager, in my last few years of high school, I was asked what it was that I wanted to do with my life. And my family had moved around a fair amount when I was a young person, so I had lived in different towns, in different provinces, and gone to many different schools. And at each of them, I'd had a chance to try out a different kind of persona when faced with this sort of inquiry. So sometimes I would say things like, maybe a movie star, or a novelist, or just a general millionaire. Or if I was feeling particularly ambitious, I would say Liza Minnelli in Cabaret, or something like that. But <laughs> at this specific school, I found myself amongst young women who, when asked that question, didn't seem to think of it as an opportunity to make a stupid joke the way that I did. Instead, they would answer sincerely and with the sense that whatever it was they wanted to be, their context and education and drive meant that they might just be that thing. They said things like, I want to be a high-powered business person or a pediatrician or what was, in my opinion, a combination of the two, the president. <laughs> I didn't feel like I could ever do anything as useful as any of those things, but I knew that I could maybe do something else that could possibly also be useful, depending on your understanding of that word. So when I was asked, I decided to tell the truth. I said, oh, you know, I mean, I'll, I, probably, I, I probably just want to be a, a poet. And many of KwaZulu Natal's future middle class, gainfully employed populace <laughs> stared back at me, very confused. And finally, the guidance counselor said, Well, Jenna, what does that mean, being a poet? And I had no idea, <laughs> except that maybe it meant that I should steer clear of ovens in the ocean. Um, and almost a decade later, even when I'm asked to events like this, to read poems and talk a little bit about what it means to be a young South African poet, I still have no real definitive idea of what that means. But what I did know, and what I do know, is that it has something to do with words and the possibility around words. I felt like maybe I could break and build things with words the way that some poets that I loved very much had also broken and built things with words. They had cleared the rubble in some way and made a path with words that the reader and the listener could go through to move from one place to another. This is a poem that I wrote about that feeling. It's called On Words. She said, love, the only thing that lives is letters. The truth is a clamor, is a great rocking vibration that's brittle and sex-shelled, that's listening a conch. I've looked into that mouth and asked, did I know you from my self-start? From the first crustacean dollop of my brain, 
where both the speaking and the tongue are still sitting, undrained. Our lives wander each other, disassemble like engines, the process sudden, apparent. Stop mid-speech, take the motor out your talk, click the conversation from its context into a grammar even your mother used like false teeth, a means to an end she could take off at night, only knowing herself when she was just guns. Words shame me, so I loved them. Laundered and spelt, I felt each sentence a strain, a thin membrane pulled between throat and head until I called from the nodes of my chest instead, humming, is this where I learn into myself? Already the writing sheets above me, cursive and prophesying, doing meaning mean justice, double stitched against time. But sometimes here, but sometimes here you'll talk of language like a lover, like a whitewash of water outside a church in the Karoo, and this is how it separates you. I've always been interested in words, mostly because of my family. I'm the first Gardini, as far as I know, to have been born in South Africa and to have been taught English as a first language. Both of my parents are Italian, and they moved to this continent with their respective relatives when they were very young children. When I began going to what I used to call big school, I would ask them to tell me over and over again about their own education. Neither of them, when they began school, knew how to speak a word of English, which was the language that they were schooled in. My father told me about how in Sub-A, before Zimbabwe was liberated, the color of his skin meant that he was allowed to be educated in the same room and at the same pace as first language English speakers, but he was made to sit separately from them until after some years, he finally sounded like they did. Even if he didn't understand the meaning of what it was that he was saying, in that system, if he used an approved language to sound as if he did, that was all that mattered. My parents insisted on speaking only English within our family, but I always had a sense that we were a step outside of how we verbally communicated. As a young person in a country with 11 official languages and scores of unofficial ones, it soon became clear to me that this vague and occasional feeling of not fitting into the languages that I was being made to speak and to write in was a daily lived experience to a degree that I could not and will never probably understand for people who didn't get to operate within the same systems of privilege that I was granted access to. It was only really when I was taught to read and write poetry by long-suffering teachers in my Afrikaans, Zulu, French and English classes that I felt that words and I were finally saying the same thing. Poetry could break words open in a way that I had never seen done, seen or heard done before, but that I had often felt the urge to do myself. It let meaning both in and out of words. It was a language within languages, something that needed to be unpeeled for me to understand the structure and the necessity of its rhyme. I remember reading a translation of a line by Inge Jonker that went, Oh, the word that comes bleeding from my mouth gives form back to my body. And that was something that I had felt before, but had never heard articulated and had never imagined could be articulated until then. So on the day in high school when we were asked about our career objectives and I announced mine to be a poet, a friend who was one of the hopeful future business people, pediatrician presidents of South Africa said to me, well, <laughs> What are you going to do every time there's a problem? Are you just going to write a poem about it? And to me, that sounded like a start. It sounded just about right, no pun intended. Thank you.